the model work in Thunderbirds and all those types of shows is very specific. There's a very specific way that they make their planes fly, that they make the cars drive, the way they film it. Very of its time in terms of the grammar of the way craft are so often going left to right, right to left. I suppose the modern way of filmmaking is to, you know, to make you feel like you're travelling much more with the vehicle or much more in the centre of action, whereas you know, the Derek Medding style of filmmaking is that you're an observer. And if you go back and look at Thunderbirds, they would make their models filthy. But it's a technique that I think Derek Medding in the 60s perfected, and they had this great sort of eye for making things look realistic. It's a key to the, to the film of models. When does Thunderbird 4 look the best? When it's just absolutely filthy. It looks like it's actually gone out on mission. So our models, we would dirty them down and put them on camera. And you know, quite often, it was a building or a vehicle or whatever, we'd look at it and go, oh, it's not dirty enough. So when you actually see a model in real life by, under normal light, it looks very, very worn in and dirty. But and in front of a camera, by the time you've lit it, it loses about 70% of the dirtying down. So it's a skill to actually look through a camera and try to make a judgment as to the amount of breaking down of the model. So if, for instance, you put it on something on camera that has to appear brand new, you still have to dirty it down. And if it looks right on the camera, then that's what it has to be, even though you pick the model up and it looks like a piece of rubbish, as long as it looks good on camera. It can be very flimsy, uh, only detailed on one side. The long-term appeal of Thunderbirds, I think, is in the fact it's not about realism. We're not kidding ourselves or kidding anybody. We know when you look at these effect shots, no one's going to think this is real life. It's never going to look like, you know, reality. It's about inanimate objects coming to life and behaving sort of as though they were real. You know, when Thunderbird 2 flies, it's got to look really heavy. Not for one second do you buy the fact that it's anything other than the mod. You're not looking to go, oh my god, it looks real. That's what they were aiming for. You know, I think that's really important that, that their special effects, they wanted them to hit realism, but they didn't, you know, at that point they weren't able to. And so they ended up with this world, by luck really, you know, in which the puppets and the models inhabit the same artificial universe. And so it's toys come to life, but really good toys come to life. Not the sort of toys that you can own when you're a kid, but the sort of toys that maybe you aspire to own later on, the sort of toys that we're now surrounded with here. So we've been really challenged and pushed on our locations across the three episodes. We have scenes set at uh, an exploding refinery. We've got scenes in the Tower of London, stately home in the home counties. We've got Tracy Island, including bits you've never seen, a multitude of ice caves. You know, you've got to really think on your feet with this sort of stuff. Um, the production is going to stop tomorrow unless you provide the set. Stephen would come to me and he'd say, well, we want to shoot this tomorrow. What's the possibilities? And Hilton is the master when it comes to identifying bits of kit parts that they used on the original sets and then to reusing those same kit parts on these sets, which is, I think, really important to the success of us convincing the audience that these episodes could have been made in the 60s just really hunting down on eBay, trying to find the bits and pieces they use, little things like the grills, very identifiable things throughout the whole of the Jerry Anderson series. Things like the little bulbs, toothpaste tube tops, and trying to make it as authentic as we could, really. We have to make a long study of the, the styles, the materials, get into the heads of the model makers of the time. So it's trying to find and replicate all the original kits and toys, materials, the way things were painted, the way they were aged. This is the lounge, Penny. I control most of the rescue operations from here. Oh, really, Jeff? It's quite beautiful. Where we're matching something, say the Tracy Lounge, we've had to go back to original episodes as plans for these sets don't exist anymore and really study and work out what the measurements were to make sure they're in correct proportion with the puppets. This room is a room that any fan is intimately familiar with. It might as well be a room that you grew up in. So when we came to make a replica of this, uh, it was incredibly important that it wasn't too big, that it wasn't too small, that you know the colors were right to get it to look right on camera. To get the dimensions right, I took a frame grab of an original episode and then modeled 3D geometry on top of it and took measurements of it with a 3D camera on there, guessing what lens they filmed on so we could get the measurements of what, what that was supposed to look like. Say, Fab One sure is a great automobile. We like it. Don't we, Parker? Yes, my lady. We had to recreate Fab One, which I think is probably 
one of the most difficult publicised props they even had on the original series. So we were loaned sections of a Fab One model, which then we had to modify. And I just happened to have, from 20 years ago, some casts from the original uh, Thunderbirds Ago Fab One, which I then reworked to make it look something like the first series car. I can't think of another series where people have attempted to bring it back and do it exactly the same way. Maybe because most of the time it's not possible. If you suddenly decided that you wanted to remake I don't know, 1960s Doctor Who or the Avengers, you know, you, you wouldn't have the actors around. So in that sense, it would be an impossible feat. For us, with these recordings, with the fact that our stars are made of fiberglass, whether they be puppet or vehicle, that's something we can do. If we were producing a new marionette series, I think it would be a lot, lot easier than what we're trying to do now, which is to make an exact recreation of something that was made five decades ago, because if the slightest thing is off, suddenly everything is thrown. You're suddenly not in the 60s. But there are all sorts of things that are part of recreation that you can't really put your finger on. You look at a shot and it either looks like Thunderbirds or it doesn't look like Thunderbirds, or maybe it sort of looks like Thunderbirds, which is the worst sort of shot because you've got to go, oh, well, what's, what's the thing that's letting it down? You know, is it the lighting? Is it the, the, the puppet's face? Getting it as close to what it was is it's very important. So I think there is that added pressure, perhaps unlike if we were making something different in that we'd think, you know, this is what we want, but is it what they would have done? And it has to be the way they would have done. Particularly building something that has to appear, you know, not, not a recreation of Thunderbird 2, not a recreation of a puppet, but those little bits of detailing sets, sets that are built specially for this production, they need to be made in a way that looks like they could have been made in the 60s. One of our big problems with this is sometimes people who have supplied stuff they make it too well. And that's not to run down the original series. And we're doing this using some modern technology and it would be tempting to try and update the way we're doing things, but really you have to keep bringing it back to the 60s.